My name is Sarah Jones Morris. I'm a landscape architect and the chair of the Landscape Institute Southwest. As landscape architects, we plan, design, manage outdoor environments for people and nature, and it's crucial we think about those two together. We're currently at a crossroads, and that's socially, environmentally, and economically. Um, and interestingly, Bristol, where I live, um, the City Council declared the first climate emergency, and more recently, a biodiversity emergency. But what's interesting is during this lockdown period we had in Bristol, and a lot of other areas as well, it became quiet. People woke up to birdsong, exploring different local parks and streets, and really started to reconnecting to nature. And as a result, I think people are re-evaluating their relationship with communities and cities and nature. But to thrive, we need a proactive strategy to harness that green recovery, create a new normal. So I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for this evening, Nigel Dunnett. He's a professor of plant design and urban horticulture at the Department of Landscape Architecture at University of Sheffield and is one of the leading, world's leading voices on innovative approaches to planting design. Um, so take you over to Nigel. Hi everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk probably for about 40 minutes and then we'll have time for some questions and discussion if anybody wants to. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a kind of hybrid person. I'm, I'm partly an academic, a researcher into uh, urban greening and ecology and really putting plants and ecology and biodiversity at the heart of, of, of communities and development and cities. Uh, but then the other half of me is actually a practitioner. So I work a lot as a consultant, working on real projects and applying all of that um, research and ideas into, into real, real places. Um, very, very different places, um, really socially and economically challenging places right through to um, the most wealthy and kind of affluent places. And, and in some ways they all have similar challenges and some ways they have, of course, very different challenges. So maybe get a bit of a flavor of that. Now, um, first of all, thank you very much to uh, Pippa and to Sarah um, for asking me to speak tonight. And I, I was actually given this title the new normal, greater green. And I think really what a perfect title now, I think, as Sarah was saying, there are huge possibilities as, as we're completely rethinking. Everybody's having to rethink how we live, how we use places, what places are for and who they are for. And how do we attract people into cities? How do we uh, revitalize um, the places that, that we live in or work in or use? Um, and the opportunity and the possibilities for a really incredible rethink of how we do that with a strong green agenda are there. The question is, are we able to take it or can we take it? And I think maybe the bigger question is, why haven't we done it already? Because um, all the things that we're gonna be talking about, in a way, they're not really new. I think that the biggest, uh, the main question um, that I want to address, and it's a big picture thing, is how do we all change from this, which, okay, it's a little bit extreme, um, is, uh, you know, the city environment, largely hard, largely built, concrete and asphalt with bits and pieces of green, um, but dominated by, by the grey. How, how do we change this into this? Um, and this is a, a competition, a, a, a visual from a competition that I've just been involved with in Milan in Italy. Um, and I guess just a quick look at this, virtually every surface that, that's possible um, has been greened. And, and I think you can see that there's possibly a lot more that could be greened. So how, how do we get from what I just showed to this? And I think, interestingly, to me, I think, and maybe to many of you, this still looks quite... Um, quite adventurous, quite bold, quite shocking maybe to many people. Maybe, maybe it looks a little bit kind of on the edge, a little bit out there, a little bit wacky to, to, see, to see the wildness and, and the kind of um, uh, more natural look filling, filling the spaces. Um, the bigger question is why, why haven't we started to do this in a mainstream way already? Why is it still perhaps seen as, as quite challenging, quite diff different, quite, quite, quite extreme. Because I think the, uh, the thing is that bringing nature and people together in cities is no longer 
just a nice thing to do or just a just a, an attractive thing to do where we can possibly afford it or maybe where there's the will to do it it's now really an essential thing it's it's a bit of a non-negotiable it's something that we have to do which means we have to find ways to do it and i guess the, the exciting thing for me about being in the landscape world and landscape architecture and garden design is that in a way this bringing nature and people together in cities is a bit of a definition perhaps of of what landscape architecture is all about um, and it's and it's also why it's such an exciting time um, to be in environmental design so what, what i want to talk about is is how we do it but also the why now many or all of you might Think to yourselves why why do i need to go into the why surely we all know why we have to do this and what all the benefits are but but i would um say that perhaps one of the reasons that we haven't achieved this sort of vision as a mainstream way of working is that some of the questions that we've been asking about why should we be doing this have been either misguided or have been the wrong questions and maybe that's one explanation for why we haven't got to where we all might want to be so we'll explore some of that um, I guess the bigger picture and we will go into the why I think it's important that we do that uh, because that's part and parcel of how we really understand how we get to the how is that in environmental terms we do have these three major challenges globally and I think we do have to think globally now we can't just think about what's happening on our own doorstep and of course the climate emergency and increasing frequency of extreme weather is something that's happening everywhere and even in our relatively benign climate of course just in the last 12 months i think we've had the hottest day ever on record we've had the wettest late winter and the driest spring and you know it's only a few months ago that we were suffering from endless flooding um, and then just a few months later we were complaining that we didn't have enough water and i think that the point about that is that climate change whether it's about temperature um, re in reality is really about water and it's about whether we have too much of it or too little of it um, of course there's also the movement of people and increasing urbanization the need to densify uh, and globally again the movement of people from the countryside into the cities and this pressure on space is a major constraint to working uh, towards widespread greening of cities, of course, because the more pressure there is on space for people, the less potentially there is for green. And then um, many people would say that the loss of habitats and species and extinctions and the reduction of biodiversity is equally a crisis alongside uh, the climate emergency. So, of course, these are uh, the big environmental challenges. Of course, there are many social and economic issues that we are all too uh, aware of. Um, I guess the, uh, the point I'd like to make here is that in cities, and particularly in cities which are becoming denser, high density cities, then the negative effects of these changes are magnified incredibly. Um, and it's all to do with the fact that we don't have green cities. So we don't have um, the vegetation cover, the tree cover to cool things down. We don't have the soils and nature to soak up rainwater and clean polluted air and air and water. And of course, the, the lack of contact with nature is a major issue in terms of people and stress and health and well-being. I guess it's worth emphasizing how unnatural an environment this is for us. That that we may say we love the buzz of cities and city life, but actually as animals, which is what we are, uh, we have an evolutionary history which is completely opposite to this and all of our behavior and all of our instincts and decision making is largely tied in to an environment which is very different to this, which is why when you completely remove the contact with nature, we have a lot of social and mental problems as well. So these issues in cities are, are wide ranging and deep and magnified. So if we, if we kind of accept that, then one of the solutions, and it's an urgent thing we have to do to meet these challenges, is to bring soils and nature and vegetation back into cities on a large scale, on a major scale, on a huge scale, urgently, to help us meet these challenges. 
And that is, of course, because nature and plants and vegetation and soils, and it's this whole complex. It's not just about trees, it's not just about plants, it's about plants and soil and biodiversity all together as a system. But because the, the scale of the challenge is so great, then it has to be done everywhere and it has to be transformational. And I think this has to be a big message from, from this talk that the days of playing around and tinkering around at the edges of all of this are well and truly over. So um, a green roof here, a rain garden there, a meadow there, a little bit of garden space somewhere else might have a, a small scale local effect, but we have to join these things up and we have to really think very differently about the scale of action. And again, that then leads us on to the, the point about how do we do it? Well, I think the thing is that um, we can't just leave it to nature to do this, uh, where people and communities are involved. It does need to be planned for, it does need to be designed, and it needs to be nurtured. So it's not just the planning and design, it needs to be maintained and managed, and it's the whole process over time. And this is why the whole wider environmental design um, profession architects, plans of architects, planners, ecologists, and so on, um, really are all involved, need to be involved working together to, to meet these challenges. But the, 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 the issue really, when we start to think about um, cities and more dense cities, is where does that green go? And um, I guess another transformational aspect, and I think a lot of what I might be saying is that we need to throw away a lot of our received wisdom, throw away a lot of the things we've been working with, maybe even throw away a lot of the assumptions about what's good and bad and what's right and wrong. Uh, and one of those assumptions is that, that landscape is all about green space. It's all about parks, gardens, green space. Well, um, it is, but, but when you look at something like this on the screen, where, where is the space unless you demolish everything to put extensive large areas of parks and gardens and green space in? We, have to think also, of course, about the rooftops, yes, the walls, yes, but also the pavements, the parking lots, the car parks, the roads and the highways. We need to think about business parks and commercial developments. All of these places that would normally have been almost no-go areas or, or would, you would think would have no possibility for anything of any interest. Well, maybe this is where a lot of the new opportunities are and maybe some of the most exciting opportunities. And then, yeah, of course, we can also think about parks and gardens, but we need to think about the whole wider network of potential green and not just about maybe how we thought about it in the past. I guess um, just to bring it home, and I don't need to go into these benefits very much, but I think this is so striking. I've done a lot of work with green roofs and roof gardens over the last 25 years. And um, this was the first one which really sparked my interest. I, visited it 20, 20 years or so ago in 2003 when it was quite new. And it's a green roof, a uh, very famous one on Chicago City Hall, uh, the, 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 the head of the heart of the city government in the city of Chicago. And um, this green roof was, de was very deliberately made by the city government or the city council uh, and by the mayor at the time, who, who really wanted to retrofit a lot of green infrastructure into Chicago and and kind of carry out a green revolution to, 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 to turn a lot of heavy industry into a more greener economy. And, and the mayor said, well, you know, we can't really tell everybody else what to do or what they should be doing without doing it ourselves. We need to be leaders. We need to show leadership here. And so we need to put a green roof on our own building. And that's what they did, which is this. Now, if you look closely, you'll see that only half of the rooftop is green because the city council, the city government only owned half of this building. The other half was owned privately, so they could only put the green roof on the part they owned. And I think just this very small scale example really brings the benefits of city greening home. Um, if you imagine you were sitting or on this roof in the middle of the hottest day of summer where maybe the temperature at that roof surface was 50, 50 or 60 degrees even, reflecting all that heat, how would it feel to be on the gray side compared to the green side. If you were a butterfly or a beetle or a bird, where would you rather be on the green side or the gray side? If there was a sudden rainstorm, what would happen to the water falling onto the gray side compared to what would happen to the water 
falling on the green side. If you were in an office looking at this all day, what would you really rather look at? Or what would you really imagine yourself being in? I think that this, this contrast is so stark that we don't really need to, need to go any further into um, trying to explain or account for those benefits. Again, the question is, we know all this. Why aren't we seeing it happening on a bigger scale? So the good news and the great opportunity is that we can use green, we can use landscape, we can use this complex of soils and nature and biodiversity to cool down our overheated cities, to dry out flooded cities, to clean up polluted cities. And we can do it all with the same thing at the same time without needing lots of different systems and, and different organizations involved. What we're looking at here, which we'll talk about later, <coughs> which is part of the Greater Green Street Scheme in Sheffield, which is one and a half kilometers of, of city greening along a street. This is, this is doing all of these things all at the same time in the same place. Um, and it's beautiful. And I think this is part of what's been left out of this whole discussion, that we can make these things beautiful as well as functional. And too often in discussions of greening and green infrastructure, it's all about the function and the beauty is left out of it. Whereas I would suggest, and we'll talk about this later on, it should be the other way around if we're really going to make this, this work. And of course, the, um, the great thing as well is that uh, we can <coughs> rewild or wild parts of cities that you would think would be impossible to support thriving ecosystems. The greyest parts, I think there's nowhere that, that hasn't got the possibility to, to support ecosystems of some form or another. And of course, as, as many of you will know, to create and support diverse uh, landscapes and vegetation types is actually easier and more cost effective than trying to do a lot of what we would consider to be high quality traditional landscapes. It's a, it's a really win-win situation to use the, uh, the cliche phrase. Now, this is a quote. Um, which I used in, in, a green, in a book about green roofs I wrote about 15 years ago. And it's by the Austrian architect and artist, and I can't pronounce his name, Fred uh, Hunderdwasser, who um, was, was a, quite an anarchic um, designer and an artist. And he produced several of these buildings, um, residential buildings and other industrial buildings that, that supported trees and, and really were. Uh, part of the urban forest and um, I'm not sure if you can see it on this one but very often he might even put trees inside the building and they come out through the windows and this is a quote from him and it's quite idealistic but I think it's why many people um, are, are in this field everything under the heavens that's horizontal which basically means the landscape surfaces uh, and the building surfaces belongs to nature one or we must be persistent in the quest to green or to forest all the rooftops and so that from a bird's eye view you would only recognize the natural green landscape when you create green roofs you don't need to fear the so-called paving of the landscape the houses themselves become part of the landscape it's kind of an interesting point i think many conservationists are almost automatically anti-development but if we get it right then development can be really really positive of course and can can actually result in something better often than might have been there before People must use the roofs to return to nature what we unlawfully took from her by constructing our homes and buildings, the layer of earth for grasses and trees. Now, I would extend this, and, and although this, this quote talks about green roofs, I think we can now say streets and rooftops and walls and pavements and parking lots and everything um, this, this applies to. And I think it's this idealism, this vision that, that carries people along, but, but it's no longer the realm of idealists or stargazers. Um, th this is all perfectly practical and possible and, and not just on the occasional uh, weird and wacky building. Now, I'm just gonna divert a little bit because I've been talking about the environmental benefits so far and I've sort of hinted a little bit that by focusing on the function, we're, we're losing, we're missing a trick really because we have to put people first and the, in my, opinion because the whole point of all of this surely must be that we want to mainstream we want to make it the default we want it to make it not something that's unusual it's something that people almost pass without blinking an eye because it's so common 
And that's why we have to put people first. We have to about think about people. And, and the relationship that people have with nature is such a strong one. But we have to be really clever, I think, in how we harness that. Now, these photos are from me from a year ago, just about. In the spring of 2019, I was lucky enough to be in California, Southern California, at the time of the super bloom, when the desert sprang to life after winter rains. It was an amazing thing, where, as you can see here, whole mountain ranges change colour with, with flowers, uh, which are normally just quite brown, desert-type mountains. Um, the whole landscape from 50 miles away, you can see these orange mountains. And the, the beauty and the textures and, and, the, and the sheer detail was, was absolutely overwhelming. Um, and as you might be able to see, if you look closely at this image, um, people were able to walk on trails through, through this flowering landscape. Um, not just a few people like you see here. Th this, this, uh, this area was probably three or four hours drive out of Los Angeles and um, took quite an effort for people to get there. A lot of little small towns around. Hundreds of thousands of people every day uh, drove out to see this. Um, you know, millions per week, um, causing a lot of issues and problems in local communities and so on, and causing quite a lot of hostility because of the, the way that people were coming and, and clogging up the roads. And um, possibly also um, people were saying, well, this is just such a shallow, superficial thing. People coming to have their photos taken for Instagram and, you know, going away again. Um, we really shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed. But what was interesting to me when I saw people here is how, and I've seen it again and again everywhere, in a landscape like this, which is so overwhelming in its beauty, people want to not just walk through it on the paths and, and take a look at it as observers. They want to be in it. They want to be part of it. They want to immerse themselves in it. There's something magnetic about dramatic and colorful nature, um, which is amazing. And, and I think it's so different to our normal experience of landscapes, which I think is quite passive. You know, you, you go to a garden or a park, big areas of lawn or hard surface and flower beds maybe, you stand back and look at them and you say, oh, that's nice, but you're an observer. It's quite low energy. Whereas looking at something like this, it's high energy, it's active. You're not just an observer, you're an actor, you're a participant. And it's not just what you see, it's what you can smell and hear and feel and experience. Um, and it was really common for me to see people actually in amongst the flowers, almost swimming in the flowers and having their photos taken like this. Now, I see this not as a negative thing or as a bad thing, particularly because, you know, you can see here, most people are going to see this for young people. It's a hugely exciting thing and something we, we have to tap into. And I guess what I've thought for a long time, why, why should things like this, these sorts of experiences be something that you have to drive hours to see or you maybe have to pay to go somewhere or you have to be lucky enough to know about them why can't this be the experience in your local park or your local community garden or your local school why can't you see this when you drive down the highway uh, why can't you see this on a bit of patch of empty space in the city why can't this be everywhere and why can't this be something that's open to to all and i guess i've done quite a lot of work to try and and bring this super bloom enhanced natural experience into everyday life. In fact, here is um, a created um, natural experience. Myself and my colleague James Hitchmo were very lucky to be the main planting design designers for the London Olympic Park for 2012. And this is a photo in 20, at 2012 during the games. And exactly like those people on that Californian hillside with this flowery, meadowy, natural landscape. People just could not resist to get into it. I can see if you look closely, there's a, there's a girl in there amongst it, there's a man in there having his photo taken. There's something about the designed natural experience that's, that's hugely special and reaches deep inside to people. Um, the work at the Olympics was a culmination of a lot of work that I'd done actually in housing estates and highway areas in Sheffield, um, where I've seen exactly the same thing. I think the Olympic Park in London, which is, which is still hugely used, of course, um, 
gives one model for the future for parks and green spaces because it was very different and it is very different to the normal lawns with trees and flower beds. This is largely meadows and woodlands and wetlands with lawns as islands set within this glue, this matrix which flows between them. It's almost the, up, the upside down, the opposite to our normal experience of a park. And I think this image shows that we can do this and still have large numbers of people using uh, parks and gardens and green spaces as well as giving lots of opportunities for um, more individual or quieter moments. But I guess when I first started doing this, which was in really difficult places in Sheffield where um, uh, through years of neglect and, and lack of uh, investment, um, we, we, we put these meadows in with Sheffield City Council as a way of really cost effectively injecting um, biodiversity and horticulture and excitement into these areas. And I saw exactly the same thing early on. In fact, my background is an ecologist and a botanist when I started out, but really having done this for a very short time, I, I almost turned into a sociologist because it was just fascinating to me to see how people responded. And I think most importantly, when I first started doing this, I thought these are gonna be so damaged, these are gonna be so <laughs> trashed. But as you can see here, um, even on a footpath through, through a housing area, um, it, it's, it's kind of pristine. And I think what really fascinated me was, was how people who you would think would have no interest in flowers or gardens or nature would be fascinated uh, by, by the flowers and by the color and by the whole natural experience. So I guess that, that very early on, uh, got me thinking, well, well what, what, what does this do for people? And, and this is where we really start to come right up to date because although the arguments in favor of greening up until quite recently have been largely environmental, I think we're really beginning to switch now to the human aspect and, and the well-being and the health. And that's really come to the fore, of course, as we've heard already. So I guess this, this is really why I start to think that we need to put people first. We need to use the power of design nature in our built environments to unlock deep feelings of joy and uplift and positivity, because that really is what well-being comes down to, I guess. And in many ways, they're quite childlike feelings, I think, which is also often buried quite deep and, 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 and we, can, we can reach inside and pull them out. And when you think about it, what an amazing thing it is that we have the power to do through landscapes and gardens to, to, to reach so deeply inside people and release really powerful emotions. So I guess um, a, a lot of what, what I've done has led me to, to the idea that perhaps we need to work with a sort of enhanced nature when we bring nature into cities and, 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 and greening of cities. Now, this is quite a controversial thing to say, isn't it? Because if I, if I say enhance nature, it means that we can do better than nature. You know, we can go one stop beyond and, and that, that might almost seem sacrilegious. No, no, there's no way you can possibly be better than nature. But really, I think we can. I think we can be better than nature because, you know, one person's view of nature is very different to another's. And because so many people in cities have lost that everyday contact with nature, perhaps we need to work harder to really have that effect of reaching deep inside. And so part of the idea of enhancing nature is to use color and, and to really push those, those buttons. This is hugely controversial. Um, and and, I, and I, I'm partly responsible for this, this kind of sowing of the roadsides and seeding of the roadsides of cities with what you might call pictorial meadows. Um, some of you might've seen this week, Chris Packham, the, the, the TV naturalist, broadcaster and campaigner, um, tweeted uh, an image or a video from, from Muscle, Musselburgh, sorry about the pronunciation, in Scotland, of something like this, uh, a roundabout that had been seeded with a colourful, flowery mix. And he said, this is amazing, wonderful. You know, so many other councils should be doing this. And you can't believe the hostility and the anger that that provoked from many, many people saying, this is not nature, this is gardening. Um, these are not native flowers, this is no good for nature, this has no value for nature. We need native plants for native invertebrates and, and all this sort of thing. Um, 
And I think particularly over the last week or so, we need to be very, very careful with these sorts of arguments. You know, natives best, non-natives bad. Native plants for native wildlife. Alien plants, invasive alien plants. Non-native species pushing, forcing native species out. You know, if we use that same language but replaced plants for people, we'd get into a lot of trouble. But in the same way that the arguments don't stand up when you use them for people, they actually don't stand up when you use them for plants and for, for biodiversity to a large extent. And it amazes me how some people get so het up about this sort of thing on an urban highway where there probably wouldn't have been very much of value before that, um, which really engages people. It captures people's imagination. It op opens their eyes to all sorts of possibilities. Um, that, that this kind of attracts the attention when the real problem for biodiversity is what's happening in our countryside, of course, and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of hectares of, of biodiversity wiped out. So, so again, we need to really rethink, I think, and, and I see these as hotspots, which really suck people in to a more ecological uh, and greener way of thinking. So for me, it's all about creating memorable and engaging experience for people. Um, as that starting point to, um, to, to promote a much wider um, urban greening movement. It doesn't have to be about colour and wow and flashing lights, it can be very green, but I think it's all about immersing, it's about being enveloped, it's about not just the little patch of this here and a little patch of that there and, and nothing else in between, it's about having this connectivity, the transformational, immersive feel of nature infiltrating into the built development because it is as i said a powerful thing that, that we are able to do so i think it is about infiltrating transformational nature everywhere and we we do know how to do it we, we, we're not in the dark ages there's been a lot of experience a lot of work about how to make this work, how to make this successful. So we have some barriers and some hurdles to overcome, um, but the barriers and hurdles are not technical ones. And actually they're not cost ones. Um, they, they're other things and then maybe it's a lot about perception. So just to finish this maybe, I think we need to think, uh, you can't, sorry, this is, this is missed the screen a bit. For cities and to, to make this transformational leap to, to make this kind of thing the default, I think we, we need to stop looking to the past and to looking to what might have been somewhere in, a, in our site before development. We need to stop looking to the countryside and trying to recreate the countryside in the city. We need to stop looking maybe even at our native plant communities as the model for, for what we do in cities. We need to look forwards. So we need a sort of future nature. We need to think about a new type of nature. That, that matches the very disturbed and different conditions in the middle of a city compared to uh, in the countryside outside. And we need to be artful about it. We need to really be considered and deliberate about it because we need to capture people's imagination with it because however environmentally sustainable something might be, if it's not socially sustainable, it's never gonna take on. So that's how I think we start to get towards transformational greening. So we, we kind of know it's good for people. We, we know it's good for the planet, if you like. Um, but we know it's also increasingly good for the economy. I think interestingly, the main arguments that have really been put forward to date are the middle ones, the environmental ones, the ones that it's good for the planet. Um, and as I said, we're starting to see the, the, the good for people ones coming in. But like it or not, unless we can really make an economic case for this, that is one of the big barriers, that we can say how wonderful it is if we could do all this, but unless we can make an economic case, it's never gonna happen. Now, again, this is, this is quite a controversial thing to say because many people in the green, greening and urban greening movement, landscape movement would say this is the opposite to what we should be doing. We should never ever put a price on nature, something which is priceless. We should never commodify it, we should never reduce his value by putting a finite value on it. Um, you can never do that. I think, personally speaking, um, as with a lot of the environmental arguments, 
They've been made for decades and decades. They haven't got into the mainstream yet. We need to think differently. So we do need to really, really emphasize the economical, economic value. And um, Sarah was kind enough to send me a list of points, and I'll mention a few a bit later on with some of my projects. But there's more and more research which shows that healthy and well-maintained trees in retail areas send out messages positive messages about the appeal of a district, the quality of the products there, and what customer service a, a shopper can expect. Um, there's American evidence that shoppers in retail districts with, with a, tree can, a well-developed tree canopy will spend more, 10 to 12% more than without, and they'll also travel further, and they'll spend more time there. Um, and there's also a lot of evidence, and I've got my own examples of this, that uh, commercial rentals are higher where there's a better environment or more pleasant environment, a greener environment. We know and we're beginning to get the evidence that this makes good economic sense. And really, this is where I guess we come back to the beginning of this talk, the new future. We're going to have to think again, aren't we, about high streets and retail areas and how to get people back into them. And of course, there's a lot of thinking that it can't just be for retail anymore but surely they must be green. We, we must redefine what it means by a garden city. We must make the city centers a new type of garden city so that um, there are places that people want to come and be in. And maybe there's even places that people can do stuff in, in terms of gardening or, or get food or whatever. But, but really the idea of the garden in a city has to be one of the ways that we need to explore about bringing people back into commercial and retail districts. And I'll talk a bit more about that with this project. So I'm gonna finish off with a couple of projects quickly. And the first one is the Greater Green Scheme, which is what this talk's name, named after. Um, it's a scheme which is now four years old in its first phase. And the second phase of it has been planted up uh, this spring, last spring now. It's a Shepherd City Council project. Um, and I've worked with, um, the landscape architect Zach Tudor to, to do the planting design for this scheme. Uh, but it's a huge multidisciplinary project, of course. And just to put a bit of colour on this, the green line is the road or the street that has uh, taken this project. And the blue line is the River Don, which is the river, main river flowing through Sheffield. And um, about 15 years ago, we had major catastrophic flooding in the centre of Sheffield as the River Don burst its banks and caused millions and millions of pounds of damage. Um, and there was a lot of activity and investment went into the river catchment as a whole to prevent that happening. And this was the impetus partly for the Greater Green Scheme, which is basically uh, one way of, of reducing the amount of runoff that gets into the river that might contribute to, to those flooding problems. Um, this is the, uh, the street before. Uh, the total scheme is about one and a half kilometers and a third of it has been done for four years, a third of it's just been done. Um, and I guess we worked also uh, at the university with the city council to develop some of the original thinking because they didn't really have the capacity at the time to develop a lot of visuals. So I worked with some of my students to develop some concept and feasibility ideas. And this is the one which the city council really latched on to as being the closest to what their aspirations were. And this was used in all the marketing and fundraising for it. And I guess typically what was a, a dual carriageway, um, part of the inner ring road of the city, hugely full of traffic, um, is now reduced to a single lane in each direction for public transport and taxis and for access and deliveries. And the rest of the space is green and for pedestrians and cycles. And the image here shown the arrows, you can see the effect of it being like a sponge, these are rain gardens and swales which soak up the surface water runoff uh, after a storm. So this is the reality, so the, um, the bus in there for, for reference. And probably in total there's 60% of this whole area of the scheme is green. And there was quite a, a strong calculation done about how much pavement space was needed for the amount of people using it, and that was kept to that amount, so that the maximum amount of green um, could be put in this scheme. Often, it's, of course, it's the, the other way around. So uh, a quick uh, look at the sketch plan and, and um, 
the white through the area is the carriageway remaining and all the rest is gardens and pedestrian and cycleways. But the pink is the thing to look out for here. And as the legend says, um, this is, this is a, a plan that was done five or six years ago in the planning stage for this. Future development opportunities. Now this isn't a part of the city, off the city centre, which has been very, very run down. Uh, not very much footfall, a lot of dereliction and neglect. And this landscape scheme was put in specifically uh, to stimulate inward investment. And it's really interesting that it's de delivering huge environmental benefits and that's part of it. But actually the impetus, the driver for the funding was an economic one. That this was seen as the way to get these potential development opportunities filled up. And in fact, the one that's, that, that's marked West Bar was just signed off this year as the biggest commercial development site in the whole of Sheffield. And the landscape infrastructure, which went in first, was part of giving the confidence to the developers to say, this is going to be an amazing place for the people living here and working here to be in and to come to. Um, I should say as well that this was funded by EU money for that very reason. It was an economic stimulation package, not a flood prevention package, which, which funded the whole scheme. Uh, this plan here shows the planted areas and I guess the difference between the turquoisey ones, these are ones which receive surface water runoff and the greener ones don't. And none of this is irrigated, so it's a completely non-irrigated scheme. So I'm um, just running quickly through some images of the construction and the development. These are basically basins which allow the water to gather. It's directed through the liners at the side but it can infiltrate down through the base. And this is part of the whole idea of the rain garden. Sud's idea, of course, is to capture, store, clean and infiltrate the water slowly. Back filled with a artificial growing medium, which was all locally sourced. The aggregate, the green waste compost and everything was sourced as close as possible to the site to uh, reduce the, um, the carbon footprint of these materials. And then um, just before the whole scheme was planted up, and the stone mulch on top, which looks very stark, is part of making this very low maintenance and very reliable and quite clean looking. Uh, the palisade pave it, uh, fencing here is just to stop kids and dogs and cats and things running through it onto the road. Not cats, obviously, dogs. Um, it was temporary just to protect people um, from going through the planting before establishment. Um, a key thing, when a project like this is so high profile and so visible with, I think 20,000 people walking past it every single day, it has to look good from day one, but also it has to be sustainable. We use small plant material, um, small as possible really, um, in high density. Uh, and I put a lot of quick flowering things in. So this is just a month and a half after it was planted in the uh, late spring of 2016 and it already started to look amazing with this natural character. A lot of these things are quite short lived and then the longer, thing, longer term things take over. This from two years ago. I think the standard of horticulture and planting here is greater than you would find in most National Trust or Royal Horticultural Society plantings. This is a local authority scheme on an inner city street and it's maintained by Street Force, the Amy private contractors who have no special training in this they just have the normal maintenance capacity we can do these things we can do extremely high quality amazing stuff and we can do it under current local authority and development constraints i took these pictures exactly a year ago early in the morning uh, at dawn uh, in the summer uh, june 2019 uh, uh, of course completely empty but when when it starts to fill up give a sense of the the detail in the planting four or five years after establishment. Um, it's really when it starts to fill up with people that you get a sense of, of it. And I think I mentioned before, can we make these things seem so normal that people don't blink an eye when they walk along it? This is extraordinary to me to have this in the middle of a, of a city street and yet everyday life just goes on. Um, the planting, the trees will create shade, there's multi-layered, it will protect people from the, the, the fumes from the vehicles. And, and what an experience to, to, to go through this uh, every day. It, this, isn't, this is largely a, a route for people to, to get 
to somewhere from somewhere. So a, a sense of the transformation here from before, as I said, quite derelict, quite neglected to how it is now. So we've done quite a lot of surveys here. 82% um, of users, I was really worried this would be too wild, too unkempt for this inner city environment. We asked people specifically, you know, is this the right type of planting and landscape for this, for where this is? 82% of people said that this style of planting fits well. In fact, about 10% of people said we don't really care what's here. And only about 2 or 3% said no, we don't like this at all. 16% of people at the time, a couple of years ago, probably a lot more now, said they'd changed their daily route to use this street. When we asked people, would you like to see more of this in the city? Nearly every single person, this is hundreds of people, said, yes, please, we want more of this. So we know people like it. We know it works functionally. But we also know that this is cost effective because one of the big hurdles that people put up against this, oh, it's too complicated, we can't do this. Well, this is, this is, this is complicated, but we're doing it. Oh, we can't do this, it's too expensive to maintain. Well, of course it is compared to a lawn, but that's not comparing like with like. What we need to compare is the cost of all of this green with the equivalent cost of hard surface. And then it starts to become cost effective. This is cheaper to maintain. It's cheaper to maintain all of that green than it is to maintain the equivalent area of that pavement. It's more expensive to maintain our traditional hard city surfaces than it would be to maintain this amazing, complex, diverse, beautiful, immersive landscape. What's it look like in winter? We, we, you know, we, we, it's fine in the summer. We can't have this in the winter. I took these pictures in February this year before the lockdown. Beautiful. It's maintained simply by cutback once in November with things which are, which are looking untidy. And then again at the end of the winter, and then a walk over once a month to remove weeds from the edges and any litter. That's it. And we have the technology, if you like, to make it work with, with that as the baseline maintenance. We know how to do these things. So I'm just gonna finish off very quickly. My time's at an end with uh, my final project, the Barbican. I, I'm gonna be really quick here, but I'm gonna leave you my with you my conclusion, with my conclusion at the start. When we work in a transformational way that's sustainable, that's ecological, that's green, then it's really challenging because places look different, people start to use them differently, people experience them differently, maybe we start to bring in and engage a whole new different set of people and we start to maintain them differently. They're challenging for the public, they're challenging for designers, they're challenging for managers, they're challenging for cities. It's all challenging but it's not is not an impossible challenge. Uh, so this is the Barbican, which is about as grey as you can possibly get. Um, really brutalist, amazing. Um, this this cut through, I think, um, just shows that how the landscape that you see there is all podium. It's all it's all above something, whether it's car parking or theatres or art galleries or whatever. Um, the landscape which people think is is on the ground is actually often above, and of course that's a very common. Uh, city thing. Uh, previously the, the, the landscape would be very what you would call traditional municipal, lawns, bedding, uh, evergreen kind of big shrubs. Um, a resident sent me this picture of what the area we're going to be talking about looked like before um, the, the transformation, very pleasant. Um, but as a podium it can only be could only be kept this green by an automatic irrigation system that pump water into it all the time and um, also as a podium, uh, a leak developed in a waterproofing six or seven years ago, had to be re-waterproof, which meant taking all this away and starting again. And the City of London Corporation, the local authority that, that owns this said, um, we want to make this a leadership project as a climate change adaptation project. And we do not want to have an automatic irrigation system in here because in the future, we think we're gonna be subject to water use restrictions on a regular basis and it's gonna be so expensive to pump water into this, we might not be able to anyway. So I was really brought in to create a new landscape that didn't need any irrigation as a, as a, as a default to it. Um, 
And of course, again, it's really challenging because this, 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 the setup here as it was before is very neat and tidy, but a huge amount of energy put into maintaining sterile ground conditions, bare soil, uh, with monoculture plantings and, and strips of lawn. Uh, and of course the seasonal bedding, which is in itself is an intensive uh, thing to do. So our proposal was to, this is pretty much the same view as just before, was to replace that with, with something much more um, naturalistic, uh, which would be equally colorful, um, would bring a lot of wildlife in, but would almost sustain itself. So that was the vision. Uh, you can't believe the amount of consultation we had to go through for this. It took a whole year. Um, the challenging nature of it, of course, meant that there was a lot of resistance to it. And uh, even in the early years, there still was. There isn't any now. I, I, I have overwhelming positive comments about it. So this is how it looks now. I'm looking across the whole area. No lawns, no bare soil. Um, drought tolerant plants in design plant communities. And, and they kind of work with the whole succession of things which flower one after the other um, with, with peaks at different times throughout the year. This is a, a picture which would have been taken about probably early May to the middle of May. Um, I took these photos about a year ago, 2019. So this is four years after this was planted at the end of May, 2019, uh, to give a, give a sense of how, how it looks. And I guess it has all those qualities I talked about before of this natural feel but design nature, enhanced nature, and a low water use. It's, we, we've got the figures. Compared to the previous landscape, this has resulted in a 70% reduction in water use. It's not a no water use, we have to keep it alive, but it's a 70% reduction in water use, and that goes directly into a cost saving. Uh, that's how it looks now, or a little bit later in the summer. Um, very, very different. And this is part of the, the message, isn't it? If we start to be really sustainable, things will look different. And, and part of the thing is bringing people along with that because it's really exciting, but it's challenging. Uh, and then a bit later on, it's more about seed heads and, and, and structures. But a big thing was that it had to look good and fresh in the winter. This is a November picture. Uh, and, it, and in many ways, it's as vital and fresh in, in December like this as it is in, in the summer. Um, 40% reduction in maintenance time compared to the previous landscape. And we have, for the first time, uh, a residence group that work alongside the city gardeners every Friday morning, and they just kind of do top up stuff uh, to, 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 to enhance what the, um, the local authority or city of London gardeners will do. But there is one gardener here, uh, half time does, does this basically. So, so that gives a sense perhaps of, of, of the, the time that's involved, which is for the area and the complexity, very, very small. Uh, and finally, really crucially, we produced a maintenance guide to a lot of training. Uh, I actually sat down and did a session like this with the gardeners at the start, and they said it was the first time ever that anybody had ever explained the ideas behind a garden or a landscape that they'd worked on. And I think that was a really important part of them really uh, becoming really enthusiastic about it themselves and I think what's great now is that, that there's a lot of skill built up uh, just within the site through experience. So my first question was how do we change from this into this and I think it's a mix of practical techniques that we know will make it work but I think it's also a change in attitude and approach and maybe a reprioritizing the why as well as the how. So that, that's it for me. I'm going to stop there and hand back to, uh, to Pippa for the next stage. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Nigel. The chat function has been filling up with wonderful comments and, and several questions. So as best I can, I'm going to pick out a few of the questions that were asked. Some covered some of the same topics. So I'm going to kick off with Matt R. Jackson. Matt, can you unmute yourself to ask your question? Good evening, Over. everybody. Thank, thank you, Nigel. That was just fantastic. As I, everything I'd hoped for and more. Um, really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, we have a number of projects um, in Arab where we can hopefully aspire to do something close to this in the near future. Um, 
the biggest challenge I have on one particular project in Ireland at the moment is relating to the local authority and their stubbornness to just accept um, the business case, really. Um, they don't see development um, as being a, a sell for them. It's all about the maintenance costs. You have answered, to be honest, in the process of your presentation, a number of the points or you've picked it up in a number of areas. I just wonder if there's any expansion on that to, to turn some of these um, uh, old thoughts from some of our friends at the uh, maintenance level to, to, to embrace well, it. And well, I've just seen that uh, Zach Tudor, who's the um, landscape architect from uh, Sheffield, is, is in on this as well. So um, I don't know, Pippa, if it's allowed for, for, for Zach to also uh, chip in, but um, I would say, because Zach really is at the, the cutting edge of, of, of making this, this work, but, but certainly with the schemes that I do, um, it, it's almost starting with that at the beginning, the maintenance, um, and, and kind of working backwards from that, because you know, it, it's kind of pointless doing wonderful things if, if there just is not that capacity or ability to maintain it. Um, and I think that's, that's really why um, at Sheffield, both James Hitchman and myself, we've focused as much on practical and simple and easy maintenance techniques as on the design and the plant combinations. And um, it's been quite difficult and it's part of the challenging thing because we, we started our work in response to the, the, the lack of or the reduction in skills available in, in public landscapes to, to maintain. And, and of course we can protest and and say, of course, we need to really up that. But on the other hand, I, I guess we, we also realize, well, that's the reality of the situation. And if we really want to make things work on a big scale, then they have to be simple to maintain and they have to be, to some extent, fail safe. Um, and, I, and I think really what we've done, and, and Zach has really taken this up and, and made it work on, on a big scale in Sheffield, really made a name for the city now. Um, I think we develop the techniques which, which are to some extent fail safe and quite simple. They're not no skill, they're not no maintenance, but once you, you get into it and you have maybe have somebody in the system who can get on top of the basics of that, then, then they can be made to work. So I, I think I, I would just say in, in answer to your question that, that you know, we, we can make things simple and we can make things cost effective now. So, so those arguments, um, they're almost put up as a, as a way of not doing it um, because there might be other reasons for not wanting to do it, but they're, they're becoming less and less valid a reason as, as many of the other barriers are that are often put up. Um, I don't know, Zach, if, would, if, would you have anything to say uh, about your experience in Sheffield? I, I, think, I think it's down to individuals. Um, I really do. Um, I think, uh, I mean, obviously the benefit of me being in place and being sort of, embedded in the city council is a big thing but it's also a big part of how we've achieved what we've achieved has been about th these are just highway schemes really that it's a highway scheme and this is all just glorified grass verges with multiple benefits to them and if you sell it that it's just a highway scheme with a verge and then you start elaborating and developing and 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 you know the snowball effect of the opportunities then sort of start coming in um, I mean, a lot of the time, I mean, the, to be fair, the first phase of Greater Green, I didn't really tell anybody that what we were going to be doing in terms of all the planting elements. It was just a verge. So, and then it's been such a success. We've obviously, as Nigel said, we've, we've elaborated and taken the, the next stages and we're doing an even bigger project at the moment in the city centre, nearly two kilometres long. So it, it, we are really getting an impetus now and people are just believing in what we do and are letting, you know, letting me just take the set the reins on all the highway projects at the moment in terms of where we're leading, you know, there's a conceptual stage development and it's, it's just buying into it, I think, getting in and working with highway engineers and, and talking their language and just sort of developing your skills from that base. I mean, I've been doing it for the last 20, 22 years now and I'm almost a highway engineer as much as I am a landscape architect. But, you know, I, I, I just think it is about the individuals and selling the scheme and keeping it simple and not overlap, over elaborating from the very starting point. In climate change and all those benefits, yes, but all of that snowballs, and that's one of our big drivers now for me to sell this to our senior officers and councillors, is that we can start dealing with all of these problems we have in the city with the climate change resilience, 
and just it is a real tool for us that our streets and spaces become a positive, not a negative to the to the city. So yeah, Thank that's you. It. Yeah, Thank I guess you both. The is that the benefit of having something real, even if it's a small example for real to see, um, as, as a demonstration even, uh, as Zach says, can then snowball off uh, uh, to, to have something real rather than just talking about something. And I, I know from the local authorities that the Architecture Centre works with um, through its design review work um, uh, run by Design West, um, that many local authorities have declared a climate emergency. So this is a really practical measure and beautiful measure that, that they can, can follow up that declaration with. Um, I'm going to ask Alison now. Um, Alison has a question about the transitioning from hard landscaping to, to soft landscaping. Alison, can you unmute yourself to ask the question? Hi, hello. Thank you, Nigel. That was fantastic. Um, really, really inspirational. Um, so my question is, how do we retrofit these systems into really difficult hard landscape areas where they're so desperately needed, but with really difficult infrastructure um, it, and also uses, I suppose, um, heavy use by vehicles. We've got underground infrastructure. Um, do we need to redesign the roads in order to be able to do this or uh, and the systems to create these areas or do we simply cherry pick them because a lot of the road infrastructure that is around so i i'm based in stoke-on-trent and the road infrastructure around stoke-on-trent is very narrow it's not dual carriageway everywhere um it's very um populated with housing and access to people's driveways and things like that so we're actually in a position where we you know, to, to do this in a city like this, it's not quite on the same scale as Sheffield or Manchester or Birmingham or Bristol. You know, we're a smaller city, although we're very widespread, it's got very different needs. How do we go about doing something like this city so different to somewhere like Sheffield? Yeah, well, it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And um, it's a very real question. And of course, it's a really difficult one. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that, you know, at, at, in essence, these are low tech things um, which, which don't necessarily need a huge amount of, of, of infrastructure to make them work at a small community scale. Um, and, and sometimes maybe you can't do it on a big scale, but you can do it on a small scale where it's appropriate. I think also um, we often strive for absolute per perfection and have the most wonderful rain garden or, you know, um, bioswale that will soak up everything and, and solve all the problems. But sometimes it, it's good just to be good enough rather than perfect. And one of the, the big benefits of, of putting these, these features in to intercept runoff, for example, is that even if you take out a small amount, then you're having some benefit. Uh, and particularly where you have an existing road infrastructure and an existing drainage system, then you have the potential to take some of that water out, but then it can overflow and overspill into the, the existing drainage system. Um, so, so maybe you're working with quite shallow, shallow systems, for example, rather than deep excavations. I think one of the benefits of the Sheffield experience is that a lot of the Greater Green routeway went along former tram routeway. So there'd been a tram line in existence for uh, since Victorian times, whatever, which meant there hadn't been a lot of excavation underneath to put a lot of modern services in. So it was possible to, to go down there. Um, but, but I would say in essence, these are small scale. And in America, where a lot of these actually rain garden ideas originated, they were very small scale, very community focused and, and quite domestic. Uh, and then the ideas were taken up and, and kind of used at a public scale. Um, we just started a research project at the university actually in Hull um, working with a community group to retrofit a scheme around a local church. And one of the issues is, you know, how, how do you work with communities to do this, um, to kind of get benefits for, for the community and, and also the, the, the environmental benefits, because it is challenging. I'm presuming, though, that in all, not all of these situations would require a rain garden approach. So you would, if you're trying to green up the city, it doesn't necessarily have to be rain garden, but it has to be below maintenance aspect, I presume. I think, 
exactly. And um, a lot of it is about changing practice and, and, and just doing things differently. And, and also being really innovative and creative. Um, a friend of mine, someone you might know about, is, is John Little. If you don't know about John Little, then um, he is a landscape contractor and designer who has excelled at looking for opportunities in the ordinary and every day and really being extremely creative with that in a very low cost way. Um, his company is called the Grass Roof Company and his website is just full of small scale, low tech um, interventions that, that can be achieved really easily and, and at almost no cost. Mm -hmm. So I think lack of space or lack of width or whatever isn't necessarily an impediment. Um, it can very often about just doing things differently with, with what you have. Thank you. Someone's just put a link to that company in the chat. Um, so, um, Alison, you can look, look in the chat function to find that. Um, I'm now going to go to Olivia. Olivia, can you unmute yourself to ask your question? Hello. Um, I'm not in the industry. I'm just an interested lay person. Uh, so I work in Manchester, which is being ripped up and rebuilt at the moment. Um, and I'm really disappointed at the lack of green space going in. Uh, how does one, I don't know, how do you like complain about that or make an impact as a layperson? Well, <laughs> um, these are all great questions. And of course, I, I struggle as much as that you might do with this. But um, I think I would say that there is kind of with, with everybody's means to raise the profile of the importance of uh, greening wherever they can and, and whatever they can. And um, if, if it can't happen now, it's not gonna happen. The, the, the door is almost wide open to it. And um, I think those of us in, in, the, in the professional capacity maybe almost have a duty to, to keep pushing at this and to get maybe come together um, to uh, educate and to, um, to promote. And it's all about raising the profile, I think. I think, um, I think more generally within the landscape architecture world, and that's reflected within a wider world, um, planting and soft things are seen as just that, soft. Um, not particularly hard, not particularly exciting, not really where it's at. And um, certainly, you know, a lot of engineers would, would really say, this is just something I don't understand. And I think that's probably part of the problem, that it's just so outside of that particular realm of experience and training that, it's seen as completely nothing to do with it. Um, I would just say that maybe like I'm doing now and like many other people can do and like Zach is doing that when you have successful schemes, it's really all we can do is to promote and talk and to raise the profile and, and really shout about them to some extent so that message gets through. Because like you're saying, I think there's also a popular demand for this as well. You know, councils potentially are democratic institutions and there, there can be very much a, a, a popular demand for this and an opposition to a, a, a hard infrastructure approach. Um, and I would also say within landscape architecture is changing, but, but the idea of gardens and gardening and horticulture and everything is something that a lot of landscape architects have run away from because of the association with domestic gardening. But I think we need to kind of celebrate the idea of the garden mentality and bring that garden mentality into the city and everyday life because it's about the mentality about what gardens do for us that's really important. So I'm not sure if I've helped you in any way with that answer, but I think all of us in our own ways have to just push and push and push um, that there's an alternative way of doing things. I think everyone uh, in a city would like their own version of the High Line. So, yeah. Please do more. <laughs> exactly. Maybe you should take that your councillors on a visit to Sheffield, Olivia. Invite them to go there. Um, I'm now going to take a, a question from Cynthia. Cynthia, could you unmute yourself, please? Uh, hi, Nigel. Thank you for your very inspiration talk and amazing images. And uh, my question is something I've heard today actually uh, by Tim Waterman and Ruth um, Catlow, who, where they were saying about 
the future maybe of, of new commons, you know, as a shared and collective um, practice that is actually spatial. Um, and it's not given or claimed, but it's shared and co-designed by the community. So it's shared, therefore must be maintained by the collective. So what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, I think um, all these different ideas, I mean, what I've tried to say in just a few limited ways is that we, 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 we can't kind of be complacent with how things have been done all the time. And just because things have been done in one way, that's how they should be. Uh, and I think we just need to be future looking rather than backward looking and just be open at this time to all sorts of other possibilities. And the idea of common land uh, in a, a reinvention of that term, I think is a really interesting one. Um, because it comes back to that previous question, actually, you know, about how, how people can become involved with a big sense of ownership over something. And in, funnily enough, um, when I started the University of Sheffield, my predecessor was an ecologist called Oliver Gilbert, and he, he, he termed, coined the term urban commons for brownfield sites, for, for abandoned, neglected sites, because he saw those in exactly the same way you're talking about. They, they were kind of uncontested sites that anybody could go to. They were undisturbed, great for wildlife. Um, and they were kind of, didn't often have any fences around them or whatever. So I think that's a really attractive idea. And, and I think we should really be open to um, alternative ways of, of, of bringing people together to be positive with our spaces. Um, and like I said, to me, the word green space is a little bit tricky because it, again, is a bit backward looking to me. And I think it's, uh, it, it's about space in different types and different ways that people can be involved with it. But it's about, it's about bringing life to those spaces, not just for people, but for, for, for wildlife and green as well. And do you so, think, yeah. yeah, sorry, do you think that perhaps we as designers, um, we need to step back a little bit and, and, you know, give back the power to the, to the local people. So then they, they care a little bit more about the spaces and, and perhaps they will, you know, take the weeds out and a litter pick or, you know, don't even put the rubbish in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. And um, I mean, just as a, an example on this talk, alongside the Greater Green uh, scheme, there was a little triangle of private land, um, which, which had been really unused. Um, and we developed that as a community space. It was called Love Square. Um, and quite a lot of business around it, solicitors and accountants and, and, and um, cafes and so on. And, and we found a huge willingness from people working in the offices around to actually maintain that space. And that's, in fact, that's how that's maintained. And in some ways it's, uh, it's the, in their own self-interest because it's on their front doorstep, but, but also it's in the wider economic interest. It's interesting, I am, um, I think I tweeted something about the Greater Green Scheme a week, a week ago or two weeks ago on Instagram or something. And I had a reply from a cafe owner um, next to it. And he said that the great, before the lockdown, obviously, but he said before, the lock, before that, um, it, that the Greater Green Scheme had transformed his business because he was having low numbers of people coming through. But, but now before the lockdown, he was almost overwhelmed with people coming to the cafe. And it was purely because people were now coming into this area because of the, the, the environment and the change that that had made. And um, it's that sort of sense of connection, I think, that, that makes people really want to get involved with, with making sure that, that that environment and that location is, is looked after. So I think, you know, I just on that small scale, I've got real evidence of that. And mm -hmm. you're right, I think there's a really big case for facilitation rather than dictation in terms of what happens in spaces. Great. Um, I've got just one more. There were so many questions. We're just, we can't possibly go through them all. I'm really sorry about that. So I'd just like to ask Pete Swift to unmute himself. Um, well, the, evening, Nigel. <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> I was a pupil of Oliver Gilbert. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think that must be what sent me on my way to being a landscape architect. And, and the sensitivities with, uh, with what you do. But, but my practice of the landscape architects on West Bar, and um, so full circle for me, having been a, a student in the city and about to send his son to study there as well. Um, and uh, it has been an absolute 
inspiration for our project there. I mean, notwithstanding our inspiration, interesting what Olivia said about Manchester, I would say keep your eyes on the Victoria Station district before you, uh, before you write off Manchester's likelihood of getting a high line. Um, but I think, I think what's been interesting at, at, at West Bar in particular has been that the draw for the private sector of essentially having an address where the Greater Green is the front door as opposed to you know an iconic building or a piece of architecture or whatever it, it genuinely is the the thing that has kind of springboarded the the I mean you know this project's taken a long time to get funded and over the line but without shadow of a doubt it makes our life a lot easier um, and it, it's almost it's still impossible to talk about the portability of this project in other cities I mean you know even in Leeds <laughs> <laughs> Probably more so in Leeds, maybe because of the rivalry um, between the two cities. But I would say, look, I think there are many of us on this call who would who would shake your hand and have done um, yours, you know, and James's. But I, I think it'll be fascinating to work with you and Zach to make sure that even more of this kind of permeates West Bar because it is quite easy, not necessarily from a designer's point of view, but certainly from a facilities management point of view to kind of re regress and, and not really embrace just how how unique this has been and that point about what the high line did for real estate values I, I think greater green has clearly done for, for real estate values in sheffield massively great i mean it's really good to have that that uh, personal insight um and, and I, I really do think, um, I suppose that, you know, I, I'm a university person, but generally I think um, it is all about sharing experience and, and, and when you do know things have some degree of success, there's, there's great value in sharing that actually rather than not sharing that. So um, I, I do hope that the techniques and the experience do have a wider application and, and that it, as Zach said, you know, we all know it's so often down to individuals and if that individual isn't there, it doesn't happen. But yeah, um, I would just hope that there's a certain amount of, of legacy to this, that it's about how to do it and not who does it. So, so, you know, it, it, it kind of has a bit of a, yeah. an influence but you, you have a, a native Sheffield developer, which is quite um, a unique opportunity, you know, and a team of landscape architects, every single one that went to your university. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I would say that's a good starting point. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, I do have to say that, you know, the university presence is, was a big factor in that happening. And I think that again is, a, is another message for big cities with universities that local yeah. authorities can partner with universities to make things happen. Uh, and certainly that partnership in Sheffield has, has made that happen. Thank you. Um, I think, that is all we've got time for. And I'd now like to ask you all to help me make Zoom explode by all unmuting yourselves and giving Nigel a round of applause. So if you can all do that. Thank you. Nigel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.